In the 1920s, for I think really the first time in American history, the youth of America were developing in a situation that was significantly different than the world of their parents, that their world was different. And you guys all know that that's just the way it is, you know. Your world relative to my world when I was a kid, when I was in community college, I mean, we didn't have cell phones. There was no such thing as so, uh, social media. Nobody, I had to type my papers on a, a typewriter, you know, all, all those things that are so different, you know. Tremendous changes, of course, that come through. And, you know, I really do think this is the, it founded in the Industrial Revolution, which creates this permanent change, you know, where everything keeps changing, and it really begins to come into play by the time we get to the 20s. I mean, these, these, the youth of the 20s are growing up in the automobile age, in the radio age, in the movie age. All these new things are kind of coming there. And so you have the youth of America in the 1920s uh, beginning to create this kind of generational gap where they're, they're, they saw themselves as different, and they wanted to manifest themselves as distinct and different. And they, they really were. I mean, this is all uh, totally legit. And so you have the first significant generation gap. And what I think is interesting is that from that moment on, you know, every other American generation is going to have a, this kind of same generation gap. And each generation will come in and begin to want to present themselves and redefine themselves and create their own unique identity. And, and that's what they do, you know. And the 20s are going to do it their way. And by the time it was the 60s, you know, here's me and into the 70s. And, you know, we were kind of like, want to be hippies. And our hair was long and bell-bottom pants and smoking a little weed here, you know, and dancing to our rock music and all that kind of stuff. You know, all of it de designed to present us as distinct and different from our more conservative parents, of course. And one thing that's always intriguing, uh, each generation of youth kind of wants to offend the sens sensibilities of their parents. And, you know, ours was dressing with our long hair kind of in the hip hippie style. You know. And, of course, you know, after we're done, here comes another generation that are going to do the th same things. And I was just waiting, you know, as I grew to be older, you know, what would be the first time when a new generation would begin to offend my sensibilities? And, you know, one of the things I'll never forget is when all of a sudden young men started wearing their pants below their butt bump. And I was thinking, my God, at first it seemed so incredibly awkward to have that, you know. But, I mean, that's what the butt bump is for. The butt bump is to hold your pants up. And these guys have their, you know, I don't want to look at that much underwear. Who the hell wants to look at that much underwear? Anyway, you know, and of course, then, then it's going to be all kind of hair dyes and higher styles and tattoos up your arm and everything and piercing this and piercing that, you know. At some point, you know, the, the next generation wants to express itself in unique kind of ways. And part of it is just to reinvent yourself and part of it, of course, is to defend the sensibilities of, of the generation that preceded you. That's pretty much the way this is going to work. So we have in the 1920s the youth of America beginning to see themselves as distinct and different and then wanting to reinvent themselves and present themselves. So the kind of things they're going to do, they wanted to have their own lingo, you know, so that's, that's so classic. I mean, they started, but, we, you know, we continue this on. I have to tell you that there's all kinds of, you know, this youth language of the 1920s, and I, I swear I cannot remember very many of them. I think it's the first time they started calling things cool. But, you know, I, what the funny part of it is that there's this focus on simply the word, it, it's, it's good, you know, something is good. And so what every generation wants to do is come up with a new way of basically saying good, that that's a good thing, okay? And I think that the 20s may have been the first one to say cool. Um, I do know for sure that, for instance, if something was really cool, they called it the bee's knees. That's a classic kind of you know, 20s era little thing, the bee's knees. Oh, ooh, that, that guy's cute. He's the bee's knees or something. That's the kind of thing they would do. So one thing they wanted to have, of course, was their own language, and that continues on. I love, you know, how every generation comes up with their new, their new set of words. When I was a kid, of course, you know, when we wanted to say something was good, we could use groovy, bitchin', boss, far out. You know, we had a whole bunch of things. And then later on, of course, it's going to evolve. The one that's the best, the, the greatest ever manifestation of this, you know, in terms, especially the way that it confused the elders, was those, the youth that began to call things that were good bad, you know. Oh, man, that's bad. And, of course, it's so classic because the older generation is looking at this going, now, is that bad bad or is that bad good? You know, and the fact that they confuse them, of course, is the essential, you know, is the essential expression. And now you guys can say whatever, you know, it's sick or, I don't even know, it's dope. That's dope. You know, what, whatever is new. And I love how you can kind of just invent a whole new set of words if you want to. Let's start calling things barf. You know, oh, my God, that's so barf. You know, yeah, it made me puke. Uh, anything you want, you can begin to do and bring out and be the new word. But the 20s really begins to introduce this, this, this lingo of youth. Uh, they also began to dress in their own distinct way. You guys all know that every single generation wants to present themselves through their clothing and through their hairstyles. I can't do much with the hairstyles, so I will tell you that the, the girls, the flapper thing. 
but dress, um, again, not, I think the women are kind of, the girls are trying to be sort of the flapper look. The young men would wear beanie caps that were kind of a symbol of their rebellion of youth. The college guys would wear these beaver skin coats that were ridiculous, just big fur coats that don't make any sense whatsoever. But that would be one of the things that they would do to present their, um, their distinction, uh, distinctiveness. Every generation of youth has to have its own cool music, of course. And so in the 20s, uh, what they're going to turn to, they had their own music. And what they did, and this is really intriguing, they turned to the African-American community. And remember that part of the objective is to offend the sensibilities of your parents. And one thing that just automatically offends white parents is if you have anything to do with African-Americans. And i, I got to tell you that, you know, this continues on. Look at all the white youth, of course, middle-class white youth, to, who turn to rap, you know, and this ghetto music, of course, to, to make it create get a part of their identity. The music of the 20s was jazz, though. So this is African-American music, of course. It was extraordinary. It was innovative. It was beautiful, amazing, of course. But it had a beat, you know, and it was something you could actually dance to. And you all know that every generation of youth wants to you know, have their own kind of dance. So in the 20s, it was the jitterbug and jive and the Charleston and all these kind of things that they would do. And, and you know, of course, their parents called it jungle music and jungle dancing. And they're going to be really offended by this, you know, but that's what you do. In my youth, we were just, we would dance whatever, you know, just kind of, I, don't, I can't even do it for you because we just, I'm, I'm a terrible dancer, what can I say? But I, I just love how, you know, you finally do see the dynamics. So I don't know how old I was. I was probably in my late 50s and my, I'm, I'm with my daughter and we're going to a Sweet 16 party of one of her, her volleyball um, teammates. And the kids are out there dancing on, on the dance floor. And I swear to God, it's like they're simulating sexual acts, you know. And all I think to myself is, way to go, kids. You're offending me in a very, very cronking or whatever the heck they were doing at that time. And forgive me for not uh, being up on it. Remember, I'm an old guy. I, can't, I don't know exactly what's happening in this particular moment. But uh, the, the youth of the 20s, of course, they wanted to have their own music. They wanted to have their own dancing styles. Um, finally, one thing that really became, you know, an expression of, the, of this new generation was dating pretty much and I kind of think the kids of the 20s invent dating now prior to this there really isn't any such thing as dating you know you would have like someone you were attracted to you would ask to maybe go to take them on a ride or something like that and you go out but you would never go unchaperoned there's always going to be someone there with you okay like grandma grandma's always going to be there and if you're in the buggy you know and you're trying to do the stretch move to get you know you're gonna have grandma slap your arm right there because she's there to watch make sure none of the bad things would happen well, that's not going to happen so much in the 1920s. The youth of America could get in their car, kids in cars, for, in, a, in a very literal way, you know, and they would go on a date, you know, and they, so they're dating, and they would, here's the one I always love, they would go out to the lake and they'd watch the submarine races. Now, if you guys have ever heard of anything like that, the submarine races. And the words that they would use in terms of their activities, they, they said necking and petting, necking and petting. And I'm sure we can all guess kind of what's going on here. I don't know exactly, if we use the baseball analogy, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure it's first base and probably second base, you know, whether it's third base, or I have no idea. In fact, I don't even know what third base really is, to be honest with you. Home run I'm getting, I'm pretty much sure I, I know what a home run is. Anyway, but the youth of America were beginning to have courting practices that were distinct in, in a powerful kind of way, and really all of their behaviors, you know, were an expression of the modernization of, uh, of American society in the, in, in the 1920s. I mean, the youth of America was, going in a very interesting way as far as the 1920s are concerned. Okay, so one last, well, there's one after this, which I, have I done, I haven't yet done it, because I've messed up, I did, I've done this before. But um, I'm gonna introduce you into what I'm gonna call women drivers. And I want you guys to know that there are no women drivers jokes. There, that I would never do like that. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, women are the best drivers in the world, and if I don't tell you that, my wife, my two daughters, and my mom are going to beat the crap out of me. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Now, I do want you to know that I don't think there's any problem with women drivers, but there have, there is sometimes problems with men who are with their significant other when they're drive, when the woman is driving. Okay, so I'm not sure this is everybody, but here's my story. Um, Patty is my wife, and she was my girlfriend before that. And when Patty would drive, I would often be a little bit critical of her driving. And over the course of our relationship, I think I've been kicked out of the car four times, you know. Good news is, never more than two miles from home, so I you know, never had too long of a walk. But, you know, I, it's like I couldn't help myself. I would criticize her driving. So, Patty, I think you're driving a little too fast. And, Patty, I think you're, you're a little too close to the car in front of you. And, Patty, the, um, the on-ramp is not a drag strip. And, you know, all, all these things I would say. 
I have to tell you the very last time that I get kicked out of the car. This was actually after we were married. And so we're, we're driving down the highway, and I'm in the back seat with Katie. Katie's about, I think, two and a half years old, three years old. And I'm back there just entertaining her. And, you know, Patty's driving, barreling down Highway 91 in Riverside. And I kind of feel like she's going a little too fast and, you know, a little bit too close to the, the cars in front of her. And, of course, if I say something, I know I'm going to get in trouble. So my notion was to tell Katie to tell her that she was driving too fast. And I thought, you know, from the mouth of babes. I mean, if, if Katie ever said to me, Dad, I feel like you're you know, endangering me while you're driving, I would have felt horrible, of course. I would have slowed down immediately, essentially. So I lean over to Katie. I, I whisper in Katie's ear, Katie, tell Mommy she's driving too fast, okay? And, you know, I didn't quite think I thought it would all go out, of course. So Katie hears me, and she turns to Patty, and she says, Mommy, Daddy says you're driving too fast. And, of course, the car pulled over, and I'm out, and, of course, I'm walking home again. I do want you to know it's the last time I've ever been kicked out of a car, and I am in therapy, and I am working on it, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. So, really, no joke about women drivers, of course, um, just the men who become the problem. But I do want to suggest to you that in the 1920s, women were in the driver's seats of their own lives. The 20s is this kind of first great moment of, of women's liberation in the 20th century. And, I, you know, I, part of my image is women actually driving that Model T, you know. But they're more kind of taking over their lives and doing a number of things, a lot of things, really, that they hadn't been able to do before. Now, to suggest this to you, I'm going to create the identification of the flapper. So the flappers represent women in the 1920s. Here's our, here's our identification. And um, I do want you to know that the word is, even now, is somewhat strange in its origins for me. I've heard it came from Great Britain, and it was a suggestion of kind of a promiscuous woman. I've heard uh, it was associated with women dancing the Charleston, and they're like flapping their arms. I've even heard that it has to do with the fact that uh, it was a fashion kind of to, to wear rubber overboots, so like galoshes or overboots, rain boots, if you will, and then you didn't fasten them, you know, so that they would flap. You actually can see like in movies and in advertisements women wearing these galoshes that look like they're, they're flapping back and forth, you know. Either way, any way this is, of course, this simply begins, the flapper is what they called women in the 1920s, and I'm going to use it as a way of kind of suggesting what, to you what was going on exactly with women in the 1920s. I do want you to know that the image of the flapper was in many ways pejorative from the establishment, that a flapper was a, a promiscuous and irresponsible woman, but I want you to know that a flapper was a modern woman. That's the critical thing that's going on here, okay? And so what we're going to look at is, you know, what are women, what are the flappers doing in the 1920s? And so one thing that we see the women doing in the 1920s is that they are 